One of the things that um, we think a lot about these days, uh, your staff, leaders of the church, um, perhaps um, others, is the, the changing context in which we are engaged in ministry. It's different from uh, the context that I grew up in, uh, in terms of the world's relationship with the church. Um, you all probably know that the fastest growing demographic, when asked, what is your religious affiliation, are those who check the box, none, N-O-N-E, not the nuns, you know, those other nuns, but the nuns. Um, that's the most rapidly growing group in our, in our um, context in the United States, in, in much of the world, but particularly in, the, in uh, Western Europe and the U.S. And um, th- that's not something we're going to fix, but it is the water sort of that we're swimming in. And I, I always have that in, in mind as I think about what does it mean to be the church today? Um, COVID accelerated all of that change and, and, and put a big bright light on it. Um, and uh, we've experienced that over the past few years, the changes in the church, the shifts in what it means to be a part of the church, even what it means to consider oneself an active part of a congregation has changed considerably um, over, over time. And um, that can lead to, to despair and frustration, or it can perhaps, if we have eyes to see it, it might um, lead to new opportunities, ways to be the church in different sorts of, of ways. Um, And so I think this parable says something about that uh, to us. Remembering that Jesus spoke these words in a context not unlike ours, where um, the the majority of the world around him uh, were of varying religious affiliations or none at all. And um, to those crowds, he, he spoke these words. One of the things that the parables do is that they paint a picture of the world recreated, renewed, and restored, the world as God intends it to be. It's almost as if in telling the stories, Jesus is saying, this is how the world is in light of God's kingdom. You can come and be a part of it, what God is already doing in your midst, or not. Uh, Either way, it's what God is doing in your midst. The parables invite us into the world of God's kingdom, not so much to build that world ourselves by our effort, but to lean into what God is already doing around us, to find a kind of different rhythm to life that's in sync with God's hope and dream for the world. The other thing that the parables do is, and this is true of all of Scripture, but in particular particular the parables, is that they are first and foremost about God and God's kingdom and only secondarily about us. We tend to read them as, what, what do these have to do with us? But really, they're, they're about God and the nature and the character of God that we meet in Christ. So, God and God's kingdom are like this, Jesus will say, and then he'll tell the crowds a story. So, this morning, we bump into another parable of Jesus, as it's reported in Matthew's gospel, the parable of the sower, the soil, um, uh, as it's often known. It's a story that certainly would have resonated with the the crowd who gathered by the sea that day to listen to Jesus, Jesus teach. And even though we are a much less agrarian society, it probably resonates with, with most of us as well. We know a little bit about how things are grown. Um, And, of course, it's not really, as you know, a lesson in horticulture or gardening or farming. It's about grace. And grace, as I shared last week, is simply the unmerited favor, um, love of God, freely given in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace has a name. It, It is Jesus, the very presence of God's love in the flesh with us and for us, freely given as a gift. So here is Jesus, the very grace of God in the flesh, saying, God's kingdom is like this. A farmer planted seed. And as he scattered the seed, some of it fell on on the road, and the birds came and they ate it. Some fell on the rocky ground, and it sprouted quickly, but because it had no root, as soon as the sun came up, it withered away and died just as quickly. 
Some fell in the weeds and, and was choked out by the weeds. Some fell on the good earth and produced a harvest beyond the farmer's wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Jesus asks. Can you hear? So what do we do with it, this story? The image is of a farmer who is carelessly throwing handfuls of seed all around. Some on well-prepared soil where the crop might have a chance to grow. Some on the sidewalk where it's, it's eaten by birds and other animals. Some in the weeds, some in the rocks. Are you listening to this, Jesus says. In other words, can you see what's going on um, that's different from perhaps the way you typically think the world works? Every person in the crowd, likely, listening to Jesus, knew a little bit about farming, about how crops are grown. And they would have surely thought this farmer to be a careless fool. Those of you who've ever bought seed for a garden or for your lawn, you know that it's expensive. It's not cheap. And so you take great care not to waste it. You'd have a plan. You'd prepare the soil. You'd be discriminating about where and how you plant. And you certainly wouldn't be just casting handfuls of seed left and right all over the place. Many of you may recall that I was raised on a farm in central North Carolina. And I can recall my, my grandfather and father, among um, other things, they raised soybeans, wheat, corn, and um, a number of other crops. And I remember when I was old enough to plant things, um, I was given very specific instruction on how to not waste the seed. It was a big deal. I, I had a number of lectures <laughs> when I didn't do it as carefully as I was supposed to because it was, uh, it was expensive, precious. And so you wanted to take great care with where the seed would land. Um, somehow, in this story, uh, the farmer seems less concerned with all of that and just plants seed everywhere. And lo and behold, almost by accident, some of it seems to produce a harvest. This text is about grace. It's about God's amazing and extravagant grace. It's about how grace is given and how grace is operative in the world to, to shape the world, to bring about the result that God intends. It's about the fruitfulness of God's activity in the world and, and God's love and care for us even when we're at our weary worst. Through Christ, God speaks words of, of love and grace in all sorts of places and to all kinds of people. Words of love and grace and acceptance are scattered far and wide in the kingdom. And by God's grace, there is fruit. Changed lives. Relationships restored. Healed communities. Forgiven sinners. An abundant harvest. In some ways, it reminds me of the opening lines of the book of Genesis, where God is described as creating through God's speech. Through God's Word. God speaks, Genesis says, and it happened, and it was good. The extravagant love and grace of God has a, has a kind of creative power to shape the world. And, and this shouldn't be surprising. We all know that words, words make worlds. How you narrate the world around you, the story you tell about that world, um, shapes that world, creates the world that we inhabit. And it's either the world of what's true, or it's a world of lies. Christ speaks truth, and life and hope are born from the chaos. Today's parable points us to the fruitfulness and the power and the extravagance of God's love and grace and how that love and grace are, are so freely given, distributed widely, scattered here and there. You know that there, there are, um, are so many places in our own lives and in the lives of those around us where life has been choked out, where the seed of goodness hasn't been given a chance to, to take hold and take root and grow and flourish. And we, Christ's followers, 
are being called to those places and to those neighbors to, to scatter the seed of God's love and grace. To let others know that God has a better story for their lives. A story of belonging and restoration and hope. And, and the thing about it is, odd as it seems, God's extravagant love and grace comes into the world and into the lives of others through ordinary people just like us. Through our simple acts of teaching and storytelling and coming alongside one another and neighboring well, listening and getting to know other stories, and as we saw last week, through simple acts of hospitality and welcome and kindness. The life-giving, world-creating love and grace of God comes through imperfect people, leaders, churches, just like us. As Paul notes, God's power is actually made perfect in our weakness, in our, in our imperfection, in our brokenness. God does God's best work um, with imperfect people just like us. Alan Hirsch often says the church doesn't have a mission so much as the church is God's mission to heal and save and restore the world. We are, in other words, the hearts, the hands, the feet, the lives through which God's love and grace continue to be scattered in, in our community and beyond. And we're called to be in all the places that we live and work and learn and play the sowers of the seed of God's grace and love, even if we do so imperfectly and half-heartedly. I think in part what Jesus is asking us to consider is, does our interaction with the world around us, our sowing of the seed of God's love and grace, does it mirror the extravagance of the farmer in the parable? Are, Are we willing to be a little wasteful and risky and even careless in sowing the seeds of God's love and grace wherever it might land? Or... Is part of what's plaguing the church that we've just become too calculating and careful. Because, you know, and and that's understandable because the way the world is ordered is, is no farmer would plant a crop without careful preparation of the soil, without consideration of the climate and and the growing seasons, without a plan. And because our world is so results oriented. Everything's measured by the bottom line, and we want to return on the investment. So we like moving through the day knowing that our time and energy are not wasted, that they'll be productive. And planning and preparation are helpful for that. They can even be faithful. But, but might Jesus be asking us in this strange season of being the church to consider a different way, to take a risk, not merely to adapt to the world around us, but to, to innovate, to do something new, to expand our imagination for what is possible because, friends, everything is possible with God. After, I have to remind myself of this um, a lot. Um, still, after 30 years of being in ministry, I should know better, but it, it's still that tendency. And the, and the tendency is to to trust the, the seeds that I've planted to my plan and my hard work and my effort uh, rather than to trust them to God. Just sow the seed far and wide and, and trust the results to God. Um, it, it's true, as Will Willman points out, in this parable anyway, this, it seems to be suggested that, that waste... Um, is unavoidable in the kingdom, maybe even required. There's a lot of wasted seed in this story, wasted words, wasted time and effort. The farmer in Jesus' story seems to be anything but efficient and careful and calculating and well-planned. In fact, his behavior might be characterized as, as foolish and wasteful and extravagant. He's out in the field slinging handfuls of seed, seemingly unconcerned with where it might land. And because of his extravagant inefficiency, some of it manages its way to the good soil, and there's an abundant harvest. 
Now, Matthew gives us an interpretation, as Matthew often will do, of what this parable means. And there's some wisdom in Matthew's interpretation. Matthew, of, of course, um, offers an analogy for the various places that the seed land and the various kinds of people they may represent. But just for a moment, I want us to live just simply with the image that Jesus paints. Because even though we've come to impart, interpret, and, under, and understand the story through Matthew's lens, th- this, this wonderful story is not only about the different places seed might land and the different kinds of people they may represent. It's really more about the nature and the character of God and how God wants us to approach the world around us. This is a story, again, about Grace. A love that knows no limits and isn't worried about what we might consider wasteful. I mean, just look at the cross. If you've been around church for any amount of time in leadership or service or um, giving your time and energy to the life of the church, um, I, you probably at some point have been disheartened or disillusioned. There can be a fair amount of disappointment and even failure in this work of being the church, especially when things don't follow our, our well-laid plans and we don't see the results that we hope for, or they take longer than we think they should take. Uh, we work and, and pray and plan, but things just sometimes don't turn out the way we hope they'll turn out. Uh, some of you have spent hours preparing for that small group or Sunday school class and only to show up and there's just a handful of people, and you're thinking, what, what a waste of my time. Um, Others call and pray and invite and ask, and that neighbor just will not come with you. Um, You ask, you recruit, you encourage, but there's always a need for more hands, more leaders, more servants. You carefully steward the financial resources of the church, only to look at the the balance sheet every month and say, goodness, where is it going to come from? It's easy to, to... to be discouraged, to be disillusioned, to become disheartened, to live in fear, and to develop a mentality of scarcity. And when we do that, we tend to pull back, to hold tight to the seeds that we've been given, fearful that the seeds are going to run out, or that they'll be wasted in the wrong places and on the wrong people. But thankfully, that's not the whole story. And that's not God's hope for us. Jesus' parable of the seed and the soil speaks not only of wasted, unproductive seed, but also of an abundant harvest. Jesus did say that much of the seed landed in unproductive places. And that's because, I think, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the unproductive and the productive places. Maybe there's a lesson in there for us. What looks like hard, dry ground to us may appear to God to be an opportunity for growth and renewal and new life. I mean, look at what God did with the crucifixion. And so, in the picture Jesus is painting, some of the seed, wonder of wonders, took root and grew and produced an abundant harvest. Uh, Almost um, in spite of the one who was sowing the seeds. The parable ends in joy. It ends in celebration. It it, it ends in rejoicing over the fruitfulness that's made possible by the farmer's extravagance and just throwing seed far and wide and trusting God with the rest. Yes, in life, in the work of the kingdom, there's an extravagance of grace that may at times seem wasteful. Ruined seed, disappointing results. But the story the trajectory of this life we, we live together as church is one of an astounding success and harvest. Because that part of the story is God's work, not ours. The results are not up to us. Uh, if they were, we'd have no need of God. And so the so-called wastefulness ought not surprise us. Because we speak the truth in a world of of lies that wants to choke out the truth. 
People are invited to come and follow, and we all wander and get distracted and get our minds and energy on other things. Throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus holds up this kind of higher righteousness, but all the people around him seem to settle for the least common denominator. I'm sure it frustrated him. But as the parable suggests, the reign of God is not measured by our useful standards of success and failure, victory or defeat. Indeed, Jesus' story reveals the pattern of the gospel and the pattern of life itself. First death, then resurrection. The seed has to fall into the earth and die. And may lay dormant for a while, but then springs to life. The sowing may not be efficient, but it is faithful, and there's a great harvest. And finally, in the end, it's faithfulness that's the key. We're called to be faithful, not successful. The success is up to God. I think in part Jesus is saying, don't be fooled by apparent defeat. Uh, Don't be distracted by what you think are poor results. We may think that we're unworthy instruments of the work of the kingdom and that at times our efforts are just wasted. You may look around and and see little more than gravel and birds and, and, and weeds and unproductive land, but Christ promises there will be a harvest beyond our wildest dreams. Lives will be changed and are changed. Communities are healed. Relationships are restored. And by the very grace of God, churches blossom and thrive. If we are faithful in just scattering the seed of God's love and grace, trusting that eventually God's reign will kick in and the outcome will always exceed, far exceed, our expectations. And for that, we can be hopeful and thankful. Amen.